Welcome to the Trinity Monday Memorial Discourse 2019. Every Trinity Monday we have a discourse given uh, on a graduate of the university, oftentimes uh, a graduate on a graduate uh, as today. Today's lecture uh, uh, discourse is on Tekla Bear uh, and it will be given by Dr. Anna Bryson. Anna is a, a graduate of Trinity College in History and Political Science and did a PhD here with uh, David Fitzpatrick, the late David Fitzpatrick, on her hometown, she's just told me, of Mahara. Uh, um, also famously, she's a cousin of uh, Dan Bradley, so she's, our connections with uh, Trinity College run deep and we're delighted that she's agreed to give the Trinity Monday Memorial Discourse on uh, Tekla uh, Bear. We're honoured that today we also have among us uh, Mary McAleese. Thank you, Mary, for joining us. Obviously, Mary is a former professor here and an honorary fellow, but um, very distinguished, of course, former president of Ireland. We're delighted to have you here and we're honoured. Thank you for joining us. Also, we have uh, Secretary General to the Government, Martin Fraser, and former Secretary General to the Government, uh, Dermot McCarthy, and several Secretary Generals of Government Departments. We're delighted, too, that you've taken the time to come out uh, on Trinity Monday to hear the discourse on Tecla Bear, who was, of course, the first woman Secretary General of an Irish government department. She was um, uh, distinguished in many other ways as well, uh, and we'll hear much more about that from uh, Anna when she gives her lecture. And I now invite her to the podium to talk on Tecla Bear, 1901 to 1991. Thank you. Provost, fellow scholars, colleagues, guests and friends, I'm greatly honoured by this opportunity to deliver the 120th Trinity Monday Memorial Discourse. In a series dating back to 1895, these annual lectures have celebrated the scholarship, service and work of 116 Trinity men and just four Trinity women. This is in many ways a fitting context for my reflections on the life and times of a woman who, to paraphrase John McGahern, was educated and rose to prominence amongst men. Thecla was amongst the first generation of female students uh, to attend Trinity College. The only woman in her law class, she graduated in June 1923 with a first class honours degree in legal and political science. She entered the labour market in the immediate aftermath of the Civil War, a time of widespread unemployment and political instability. But starting in such unpropitious times, Thecla had, within four decades, won a position of power and influence as the first woman, as Paddy mentioned, to head an Irish government department. It was no token appointment. By 1959, she was an acknowledged expert on shipping, railways and labour issues, a skillful negotiator and manager, and had guided many key decisions on her country's modernisation. It would be 36 years before another Irish woman was appointed to such a position. In her retirement, she chaired the Commission on the Status of Woman and was mooted as a potential candidate at three successive presidential elections. She made a, a contribution to Irish life that, although subtle and understated, was by any historical yardstick substantial. And this will indeed be a recurring theme as I attempt to tease out Thecla's various and wide-ranging contribution to Irish society. To begin, I'll shade in some biographical detail, formative influences and education, before turning to her civil service career. And then I'll attempt, within the confines of the available evidence, to get behind the public persona, to a life significantly touched by humanity, imagination and love. And having pulled at the threads of Thakla's public and private life, I'll conclude by offering a few reflections on the role of the subtle and the understated, both in Irish history and in Irish life. Before turning to the substance of the lecture, let me take just a moment to offer a few words of gratitude and welcome. Firstly, my thanks to the Provost for inviting me to give this memorial discourse. It really is an honour and one that I think Thecla Beer eminently deserves. In spite of her wide-ranging contribution to Irish society, she faded from public consciousness in the decades after her death. Her fellow Alexandrin, Hilda Tweedy, had in mind to commence a biography shortly after her death, but commitment to her ailing husband precluded her from completing the task. Some years later, she ignited the interest of RTA librarian Jane Hall, but again, professional and family commitments forced the suspension of the project. 
In 2007, the idea for a more substantive biography was seized upon by then Secretary General at the Department of Justice, Equality and Law Reform, Sean Aylward. Sean contacted the Institute of Public Administration where Thecla's, beers had been Thecla's papers had been deposited and they in turn uh, asked me to undertake the research and writing. Now there wasn't a huge amount of raw material upon which to draw, but three small boxes of private papers, newspaper cuttings, ephemera, photographs and so forth, laid the foundations for a biography titled No Card Sold that I published with the IPA in 2009. And that book was a celebration, not just of a female trailblazer, but also of the contribution of our public servants to broader society. And in that regard, I'm really delighted to see here with us today, alongside members of Thecla's family and close friends, some of her successors, indeed her direct successor, the Department of Transport, and other senior members of the civil service. On a personal note, this has provided me with a very welcome opportunity to return to my alma mater. It so happens that it's the anniversary of my namesake and maternal grandmother, a proud South Armagh woman who was born just a few years after Thecla in 1908, and who through her shaping of my mother and godmother, both with me here today, played no small role in paving my way to read history and politics here from 94 to 98. I went on, uh, as, as Professor Prendergast mentioned, to complete a PhD here in modern Irish history, under the supervision of the recently deceased and greatly missed David Fitzpatrick. And indeed, as I put together my notes for this lecture, I was periodically reminded of his kindly, critical voice, the voice that once cautioned me to please avoid purple prose, journalese and cliché. I've no doubt that I still occasionally stray into such hazardous territory, but I'm nonetheless confident that David, with his dogged commitment to the forgotten people, would today be very, be very pleased to see Thecla Beer take her place in this series, amongst men like Walton, Beckett, Carson and Pierce. So formative influences then. Thecla was born in June 1901 at the Vicarage Street, County West Mees, the eldest child of Francis and Lucy Beer. Her unusual Christian name was apparently inspired by her father's study of Greek here at Trinity. Her only joy, sibling Joy, arrived a few years later in 1906. Although there were strains of grandeur in her mother's family, uh, mainly through the Switzers, Beer recalled that her father's income as a country clergyman was modest, and although they were never, quote, on the starvation line, um, money was very close, as she put it. She clearly enjoyed a warm and loving relationship with her parents, but later reflected that her childhood was quite lonely as a chronic illness precluded her from attending the local school. By the age of 14, however, she was deemed strong enough to leave home and in January 1916, took up an entrance scholarship to Alexandra School. The following year, she graduated to Alexandra College and having taken junior and intermediate examinations, successfully sat for the senior grade in 1919, applied for the University of Dublin matriculation examination and entered Trinity College in April 1920. Beer was, as I mentioned, amongst the first generation of women to attend this college. She initially enrolled to study English and German, but convinced that she wouldn't secure a first class honour de honours degree in these subjects, she transferred to the law faculty at the end of her first term. The only woman in her law class, she was subject to the early rules governing female attendance at the college. So she was unable to visit fellow students at their private rooms on campus without a chaperone, had to vacate the college precincts by 6 p.m. and was debarred from most college societies. With few of the normal undergraduate distractions available to her, it's perhaps not surprising that she enjoyed considerable academic success. In her sophister years, she won numerous prizes in her honours examinations, culminating in a first class honours degree with a gold medal and second place overall in her legal and political science class. Now, as a final year student uh, here at Trinity, I studied the revolution and civil war period and as such was well aware of the turmoil that gripped this city and indeed this college in the years that Thecla studied for her degree. So as I mined her private papers, I was hoping to uncover some evidence of her views on what Tomás Irish recently described as Trinity's reconciliation with the new state, or indeed her reflections on the campaign to expand female access to education and public life. There was none. This silence is at least partly explained by practical considerations. Given her father's modest income, she remained on at Alexander College as a housemistress for all but the last six months of her time here at Trinity. And during that time, she was utterly consumed with the twin goals of excelling at her studies and making ends meet. In return for a rigorous daily routine at Alexandra that involved rising at half past six, supervising breakfast, taking students for a walk, monitoring their study, ordering their books and music, filing lost property and organising plays, she was afforded her board and a laundry allowance of half a crown per week. 
Whilst the pressure to make ends meet and the limited opportunities for female involvement in student life convincingly, I think, explains her uneventful passage through college, her studious avoidance of political matters was, I suspect, more than a bread and butter issue. In an interview with Frances O'Rourke in the early 70s, however, she responded to a direct question about community relations by stating that her family had never experienced any sense of being different or isolated during the years of revolution and civil war, adding that her father had a pass from the local powers to enable him to travel unhindered through the countryside. Loyalties within her family, like many others, were nonetheless divided by independence. Her sister Joy apparently treasured her British identity and emigrated for Gloucestershire in the 1930s, whereas Thecla clearly embraced the free state and armed with her own particular brand of understated, secular and pragmatic patriotism, played no small part in its modernisation. Now, early days at the castle. A first-class honours degree from Trinity was no guarantee of employment in the aftermath of a brutal and costly civil war. The demobilisation of soldiers, together with heavy reconstruction costs, were amongst the many factors denting employment prospects. Beer herself recollected, Trinity had a structure for finding jobs, but there weren't any. It was a very bad time. In common with many graduates, she travelled to London in search of employment, but the economy there had not yet fully recovered from the devastation of World War I, and she failed to secure any offers. On her return from London, a message from Trinity alerted her to a vacancy in the statistics branch of industry and commerce, and she duly applied. A number of Trinity academics testified to her good character and qualifications. Olive Purser, Lady Registrar, noted that she was extremely keen and thorough in her studies. MJ Ryan, Reed Professor of Law, offered further sureties, listing her many prizes and concluding that he could confidently recommend Miss Beer for any position, administrative or otherwise, where her undoubted abilities and industry will be utilised to best advantage. Armed with prizes and accolades and a raft of glowing references, Beer was underwhelmed by her experience at interview. She later recalled, I went up there to Dublin Castle and was interviewed, but all I was asked for was a specimen of my handwriting. <laughs> the test was, however, commensurate with the post. In January 1924, she commenced her civil service career as a temporary grade three woman clerk on a salary of 43 and four per week, a position she later described as a fairly lowly form of life. The conditions of her employment were indeed bleak. The appointment could be terminated by one week's notice. She had no right to pension, gratuity or allowance upon termination. She was not entitled to any expenses and she could be required to attend at her own expense at one of several offices of the department in Dublin. Adding further cheer, the offer concluded that the whole of your time must be at the disposal of the ministry. The minimum number of hours per week you will be required to work is 44, and you may be required to render assistance in excess of the minimum. In the event of your being absent from duty on any weekday from any cause, payment of salary in respect of that day will be withheld. Within six months, Thecla was promoted to Grade 2 Temporary Clerk with a modest pay increase to two pounds per week. The 1924 Ministers and Secretaries Act held out the prospect of a more direct route to the junior administrative grades for university graduates. But before the dust had settled on a row about whether or not women could sit the exam, Thecla's fortunes were transformed by the dent of a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. In the summer of 1925, Beer was deemed eligible for a Laura Spellman Rockefeller Memorial Scholarship. And this entitled her to two years of study and travel in North America, years that were undoubtedly amongst the most formative of her life. Although she later suggested that there was an element of chance in securing the scholarship, her association with Trinity was in fact key. Shortly after joining the civil service, she had been invited to act as secretary to a committee tasked with reforming the statistics office. It was comprised mainly of university professors, and it was they who nominated her for the scholarship. Her former professor at Trinity, C.F. Bastable, was particularly keen that she should secure the scholarship and testified in his reference to her glowing academic record and her achievements since joining the Statistics Bureau, adding her legal and linguistic attainments would be of great service in dealing with matters of an international character. So having secured the necessary unpaid leave from the civil service, Beer sailed for New York in September 1925. At International House, she enrolled alongside more than a thousand other students representing some 66 different nations. Thanks to a generous travel alliance, she was able to intern at the Graduate School of Columbia, the Brookings Graduate School in DC, Harvard, the Institute of Politics at Williamstown, and the Canadian Bureau of Statistics in Ottawa. She heard the anti-fascist campaigner Salvamini take on Mussolini, sat in the US Senate whilst the Prohibition Act was being debated, and in San Francisco witnessed one of the first lie detector machines in operation. 
In DC, she met with both the US Attorney General and then President Calvin Coolidge. Whilst delighted to meet the former, she was underwhelmed by the President. In a letter to her parents, she recorded, Cal is the most wizened, miserable looking specimen you can imagine. Without a spark of life or animation, he lived up to his reputation for silence. Our conversation was brief and uninteresting. In contrast to her time at Trinity, Beer now had the means to a social life and demonstrated that given half a chance, her inclination was to seize the day. On her International House diary, I noted that she had taken the trouble to circle every Friday night dance for the entire year. In an interview with Tom McGurk in 1974, she later reflected on the excitement of Jazz Age America, of learning the Charleston, the tango and the black bottom, and even dancing the tango on Broadway. The diary of her time in Washington, D.C. is awash with invitations to restaurants, movies, theatres, orchestra performances, tennis matches and bridge tournaments. She learned to drive and overcame her fear of water through swimming lessons. Not surprisingly, she attracted much chivalrous attention and was quite open in communicating these proposals to her parents. In August 1926, for example, she describes a train journey from Sacramento to Portland and states, A man asked me to play bridge, but I didn't care for his looks, so as a yank say, I gave him the bird. Having settled in Portland, she noted, waiting for Glenn Bunch to call. He's the young journalist I played tennis with in Berkeley. A nice, quiet, shy boy with quite a care on me. Very uninteresting, but he'd be useful to show me the sights. <laughs> a more serious contender was Kenneth Lindsay, future independent MP for the combined English universities. In May 1927, she recounted a date with Lindsay. Off we went to the Spanish village and danced till 2.30 a.m. He's a lovely dancer and I had a topping time. He's going home in September via the Orient and has ideas that I could do likewise and eke out my finances by public speaking. He had to dash up to New York by the early morning train to have dinner with Ramsay MacDonald. Given her inclination to avoid overtly political discussions, it's not surprising that Thecla declined an invitation whilst in Quebec to speak on political conditions in Ireland and agreed instead to address the less thorny issue of Irish economic policies. The letter diary she maintained during the course of this scholarship nonetheless offers some rare glimpses into her broader political views. It betrays first and foremost her loyalty to the new Irish state and her desire to ensure that her country was fairly and positively represented internationally. She was particularly proud of the Shannon scheme, describing it in an interview as the greatest and bravest enterprise attempted by the Free State Government, adding that the British had 126 years to establish industries in Ireland but had failed to do so. She was, however, firmly in favour of Ireland remaining within the Commonwealth, and as such was not surprisingly uneasy at Fianna Fáil's entry into the Doyle in 1926, and in particular at the stirrings of what she then described as an enormous Republican propaganda campaign in the US. In April 1927, De Valera's visit to Washington DC provoked further comment. She noted, the people at the top of this house went off to greet De Valera at the station. He, Russell, is so anti-English that he turns all of his books by Englishmen or on English subjects upside down in his library. His wife, whom I know slightly, is I hear trying to keep us apart in case Charles Edward would use abusive language about the free state. Of course, I always keep out of arguments here and reply in Mr. Hooper's words, I'm Irish and my heart's in the right place. I didn't feel called to go and hear De Valera at the auditorium. To her great relief, a fellow Trinity graduate arrived in the scene to offset her irritation with Dev. In February 1927, she recorded her delight at meeting Frederick Boland, the new Rockefeller scholar who had studied law at Trinity the year after her. He's a barrister and got a studentship in TCD and is awfully nice, the very best type of Trinity product. And I felt very proud of my countryman. He's as brilliant as Duncan, but also has plenty of savoir faire. His father is Boland of the Civil Service Commission, who gave me my leave of absence. Boland considers my chances very good. Perhaps not surprisingly, Beer occasionally expressed a degree of antipathy towards the Catholic Church. But it's interesting to note that in marked contrast to some recent accounts, she strongly believed the Protestants had received a fair deal in the new state. She was thus irritated by a letter to the Irish Times suggesting the opposite. On the 3rd of September 1927, she wrote in a letter to her parents, I wish someone would choke people like Gattenby for that letter of his in the Irish Times. Now Gattenby was one of Trinity's most distinguished graduates, and in this letter he had claimed that a TCD candidate had been ranked first for a position at UCD, but that the governing body had subsequently overturned the decision. His letter concluded by suggesting that no country which drives its best abroad can have a bright future. In Beer's opinion, however, what she described as, quote, all this blah at the end can only have an irritating effect, especially when government positions are freely open to Protestants in the free state and are close to RCs in the north. Whilst in America, a number of potential job opportunities had arisen, but Beer was wholly committed to returning to Ireland. 
She later stated, my determination had always been that I was going to live and work in Ireland. I formed that determination in my childhood before I went to school. She was moreover firmly committed to pursuing a career in the civil service. Following a conversation with Freddie Boland, she said, Frederick Boland was so enthusiastic about the Free State that I'm feeling quite excited at the prospects of starting work in Dublin again, even though I fully realise it will be the devil to settle down to office life again and to leave all the friends and excitement of America behind. True to form, she was determined to make the most of every last moment of her scholarship. She departed Boston in September 1927 with a liberal sum of money to spend within a short space of time. She boarded first class with a bountiful supply of fruit, flowers and chocolate and noted that she intended sending several boxes down to the stage children. Not for the first time, she was the only woman in her class. Far from being intimidated in male company, she simply lamented in her diary that there's nobody interesting to flirt with. The only thrilling men are all safely married. The French and Italians are very amusing, but some of them seem to spend the time hand kissing, which is a very boring proceeding, je pense. <laughs> She describes a lazy time on board, sleeping till 11, taking a short walk before lunch, listening to the Russian orchestra, sipping champagne, playing cards and dancing. Having stopped off in Lisbon, Sicily, Naples, Paris and London, she landed back to the rather less salubrious setting of the statistics office. <laughs> Having followed her studies in the USA with great interest and determined to keep her, John Hooper persuaded the establishment section of industry and commerce to create a new post appropriate to Thecla's newly acquired skills and experience. Although the position of technician didn't signify a significant promotion, she was gratified to be classed as something of an expert, as she put it, and thus different to the general run of executives. She later quite rightly reflected that her sex had prevented her from being admitted at a higher level, noting, they hadn't any woman at that level, and so they just weren't sure they ought to promote me. While she seems to have been quietly accepting of the reluctance to promote women at that time, Beer was disappointed that in the deflationary climate of the 1930s, her salary of £105 per annum didn't provide for any great degree of comfort. Her finances were further stretched following the death of her father, as she subsequently assumed responsibility for the care of her invalid mother. In order to supplement her income, she offered grinds and wrote editorials for the Journal of the Dublin Chamber of Commerce, and in June 1932, she turned her hand to teaching and became the first female lecturer in statistics in Ireland, leading a BCom module in statistical method here at Trinity, a position she maintained until July 1942. Now, the Department of Finance's reluctance to promote beer was of course indicative of a widespread anxiety within the public service about the perils of female advancement. This was reflected in attempts to prevent women from applying for senior posts by competitive examination, the fixing of separate pay scales for men and women, and legislative provision for the preclusion of women from certain positions. The rationale for restricting certain positions to either men or women was based on one, or two, one of two core arguments, one physical, the other moral. Thus, for example, a 1926 commission upheld the Department of Deeds contention that female clerks should be precluded from their ranks as it wasn't appropriate for a woman to incur the risk of climbing a stepladder to retrieve books, a few years later, the Lord Chief Justice and other judges objected to the employment of female typists in the court service on the grounds of, quote, medical psychology, and another committee was set up to investigate. Now, the policy of pay differentials between men and women in the public service was upheld, as you know, by the 1935 Brennan Commission, which cited two objective matters in defence of their decision, namely sick leave and retirement on marriage. Reflecting on the latter issue, John Gorman, who served in the Department of Finance between 1939 and 1946, told me that young ambitious civil servants kept a close eye on the romantic pursuits of their female colleagues. He noted that Tom Murray, later chairman of the ESB, was always able to produce a slip of paper from his hip pocket, which conclusively demonstrated that the key to promotion was to get Thack Beer and another woman, Mara Brannock, married off somehow, so as to provide a vacancy for more deserving people. Indeed, in an addendum to the Brennan Report, Mary Kettle made clear her view that women from their entry until they reach the ages of 45 or 50 are looked upon as if they are loitering with the intent to commit a felony, the felony in this case being marriage. Now, the Irish civil service was, of course, far from unique in its attitude to the employment of women. For example, it wasn't until 1928 that women in Britain were admitted to the open competitions for clerical and executive grades. 
Despite the increasing opportunities that then opened up during the war years, an excerpt from the July 1943 issue of Transportation magazine is indicative of prevailing attitudes towards the employment of women. Now, you mightn't be able to read that, but it's a series of tips for male supervisors of women in the workforce during World War II, and it includes the following. General advice indicates that husky girls, those who are just a little on the heavy side, are more even-tempered and efficient than their underweight sisters. <laughs> You should give every girl an adequate number of rest periods during the day. You have to make some allowances for feminine psychology. A girl has more confidence and is more efficient if she can keep her hair tidied, apply fresh lipstick, and wash her hands several times a day. You should be tactful when issuing instructions or in making criticisms. Women are often sensitive. Never ridicule a woman. It breaks her spirit and cuts off her efficiency. Now, Beer clearly enjoyed her time in the statistics office, working on the first census reports and implementing ideas developed in the course of her engagement with the Statistical and Social Inquiry Society of Ireland. Besides being a woman, she nonetheless faced a very obvious obstacle in that the next grade up from her was occupied by a youthful Roy Geary. In 1934, she thus decided to take a backward step to the position of staff officer so that she could then apply for the general services grades. And in spite of strenuous attempts to retain her within the statistics branch, she was finally promoted to the post of superintending officer in the transport and marine section of industry and commerce in July 1941. The creation of the new Department of Supplies during World War II then provided her with an opportunity to shine. This new department, headed by Lamas, was central to Ireland's economic survival during what was dubbed the emergency. It was tasked with ensuring that essential supplies of food, fuel, clothing and machinery were distributed fairly and efficiently, and beer quickly became associated with issues such as the transportation of milk, turf and wheat. Her talents were immediately recognised by her superiors, and within six months she was promoted to assistant principal officer and then acting principal officer in December 43. As PO, she became more closely involved with the major wartime and post-war developments in transport and in the negotiations, financial arrangements and intricate legislation that this entailed. This included the development of the Transport Act of 1945 that created CIE, the Irish Shipping Act of 47 and the Harbours Act of 46. An acknowledged expert on shipping, railways and labour issues, she was appointed Assistant Secretary in November 1953. And Nellie O'Cleary actually maintains that that was the breakthrough, that was the, her breaking through the secretarial ranks. She continued her responsibility for transport and marine issues, helping to develop the legal machinery for an Irish merchant shipping identity, overseeing the distribution of food subsidies and assuming direct responsibility for the Labour Division. Her dedication, commitment and hard work during the busy post-war period again did not go unnoticed. Lamas, in particular, kept a watchful eye on her progress, and when the opportunity arose, she reaped a just reward. On the 1st of August 1959, Beer was officially installed as Secretary of the new Department of Transport and Power. The many letters of congratulations she received testify to the high esteem with which she was held within both the public service and the wider public. Congratulating her on her entry into the order of serv secretarial servitude, Ken Whitaker noted that the servitude will be nothing new. Nothing, no one has worked harder, been more devoted, or earned the highest recognition better than you. The majority of well-wishers not surprisingly referred to her gender. For example, Eleanor Battersby noted, your whole career has not only been a source of pride to women in Ireland, but will continue to serve as an inspiration to many who might otherwise feel that they would never have had a chance to give up their best to their own country and whom we can ill afford to lose. Whilst it was undoubtedly her sex that most set her apart in the higher echelons of the civil service, Beer's Church of Ireland background was also somewhat unusual. But in December 1933, no fewer than three of the ten senior officers in the Department of Finance were Protestant, and a fourth was a Protestant that later converted to Catholicism. By 1970, however, the number of Protestant officials and senior grades in the civil service and local authorities had dwindled, and Beer was undoubtedly one of an increasing minority. It's thus not surprising that several letters of congratulation made explicit reference to her religious background. E.G. Dalton commended her foresight in entering the civil service in the early days of the state's existence. He said, you're entering the government service at a time when our community cherished foolish prejudices, revealed great courage and independence. You were a pioneer then, and it's good to see once more that you're the first woman to hold this high office. Although there was widespread acceptance within the civil service that Beer's appointment was entirely on merit, the appointment of a female secretary not surprisingly occasionally ruffled diplomatic feathers. 
She later recalled, for example, that there were endless arguments about whether or not she should precede the minister. There was an embarrassing delay at the door of the Stevens Green Club as signatures were hastily gathered to enable her to offer the vote of thanks at an all-male dinner. Beer was also later recalled with bemusement that as secretary to the department, she was invited to the annual dinner of a state company that she had minimal dealings with. She noted that she was all the more confused to discover that she was the only female guest. When she finally plucked up the courage to ask why she had been invited, she was told that two women were shortly due to qualify for this profession. And to allay the fears of those who were against admitting them, she had been invited along to see whether or not having a woman present would spoil the annual dinner. <laughs> she was relieved to learn that the women in doubt were admitted the following year. Now, the department to which Thecla was appointed secretary took in all of the responsibilities previously contained within marine services and inland transport, whilst the power element embraced all matters relating to the procurement and distribution of all types of solid fuel, oil and petrol, the gas acts, the ESB and board pneumonia. One of the key challenges confronting her was the rationalisation and coordination of a complex constellation of state-sponsored bodies. By the 1960s, the staff of these bodies outnumbered that of both the civil service and local authorities combined. The sector was dominated by a few giants, with CIE, ESB, Aer Lingus and Board Nomona accounting for two-thirds of all employment in the state-sponsored sector. With some degree of truth, Patrick Gilligan quipped that the Department of Transport and Power's remit was essentially jets and other debts. Holding her own with boards that, in the words of Lamas, saw themselves as sovereign independent authorities was no mean feat. She nonetheless shored up Irish shipping, set about the renewal and modernisation of CIE, managed threatened industrial action in the aviation industry, led a delegation in sensitive commercial talks with the American government, and was centrally involved in cross-border cooperation in electricity, transport and tourism. The latter, of course, helping to lay the foundations for the groundbreaking political meetings of the 1960s. Beer retired from the civil service on the 20th of June, 1966. A few weeks before her formal departure, a luncheon was held in her honour at the Mayflower Hotel in Washington, DC. And this was a very fitting finale for a career that had in so many ways been primed by that postgraduate scholarship to North America some 40 years previously. Now, like many illustrious public servants, some of whom are with us today, Beer's pace of work scarcely faltered in retirement. As she quietly quipped to Kenneth Milne, I'm the statutory woman and the statutory Protestant, and if ever there's a small group, a small committee, and they want to make it really representative, I'm the one that gets caught. <laughs> First in line was the Public Services Organisation Review Group, the group established in 1966 to conduct a major review of the entire system of public administration. Thecla also served on the Council of Alexandra School and College as a governor of the Rotunda Hospital, as a member of the Protestant Education Committee, and was a committed and active member of the Irish Times Trust. Perhaps the most notable contribution Thecla made to public life in her retirement was, of course, her chairmanship of the Commission on the Status of Woman. The campaign for female equality in the 1970s is commonly associated with prominent individuals such as Nell McCafferty and Mary Kenny. But behind the scenes, this commission painstakingly researched the various barriers facing women in Irish society. And Beer's report was an, an important milestone with an enduring legacy. The establishment of the commission came about as a result of international pressure, directly from the UN and indirectly in anticipation of EEC membership. At the Fianna Fáil Ardèche in January 1970, Lynch announced the government's intention to go ahead and set up the commission, adding that it would be chaired by, quote, one of the greatest women ever in the history of Irish public life. Reflecting her innate pragmatism, Beer was adamant that the committee would be comprised of an equal number of men and women. Having surveyed the experience of such commissions in other countries, she was convinced that, quote, no matter how good an all-woman commission might have been, it would in all probability have been accused of taking a prejudiced and emotional view of many of the controversial issues involved, with a report agreed by both men and women and supported with facts, statistics and research, I think we stood a much better chance of success. Within two years of their first meeting in April 1970, the Commission had indeed agreed, uh, had an agreed report to present to the Minister of Finance. Clear and succinct, it dealt in turn with equal pay, employment, social welfare, taxation, the law, politics and public life, education and cultural affairs and women at home. It was met with almost universal approval. The Sunday press ran with a huge headline heralding a radical deal for Ireland's woman, whilst the Independent proclaimed it a document for our times. 
Moving a motion of support, Senator Mary Robinson described it as the most important social document in recent Irish history and commended the fact that it was comprehensive, very well balanced and extraordinarily readable. On the back of this report, the Anti-Discrimination Pay Act was passed in July 1974, providing for full equal pay by December 75. The marriage bar was removed first for the civil service and then from all categories of employment. The Social Welfare Act of 73 responded to many of the report's observations on the plight of widows, deserted wives, prisoners' wives and unmarried mothers. Beer estimated that by the end of 1974, half of her recommendations had been implemented or were in the process of implementation, one third had been accepted in principle with work proceeding towards implementation and only one fifth had not yet been acted upon. Now, this was clearly not the last word on women's issues. A controversial recommendation on contraception was deemed ahead of its time. And it must also be acknowledged that the introduction of equal pay and the removal of the marriage bar did not affect a revolutionary change in the proportion of women reaching the higher echelons of the civil service. At the instigation of the Council for the Status of Women, a second commission was thus established by Charlie Hawhey in November 1990. The members of that committee were, however, careful to acknowledge the success of the first commission. Francis Fitzgerald, chair of the Council for the Status of Women, emphasized that the first commission had brought about a change in attitudes because there it was in writing, equal pay must come in, the marriage bar must go. Very strong messages about the rights of women, about the way women should be treated. In an interesting reflection on her attitude towards female equality, and indeed perhaps civil service values, Beer later reflected that she felt compelled to accept the invitation to chair the commission. She said, I felt it was my duty as a woman. I had got there and I felt I should do my best to help other women. That was the reason. She added that she had in her own career done her best to help women advance and in particular tried to put them into jobs where they would have a chance. And indeed, former President Mary McAleese, who I'm really honoured uh, to have with us today, later attested to Beer's unfailingly affirming and supportive nature and noted that she had been a big role model for her as a young professional. Whilst Beer is thus rightly held up as a trailblazer for the advancement of women, she was never an active feminist. Her struggle to pay her way through university explains, I think, her lack of involvement with the first phase of the women's movement. But unlike many other contemporary female graduates, she seems to have made a conscious decision not to become involved in some of the leading professional women's organizations of her day. The Dublin University Women Graduates Association, the Irish Federation of University Women, the Irish Women Citizens and Local Government Association. Indeed, in later years, she remained uncomfortable with the term feminist, preferring to state that she was in favor of equality. She said, if I saw anything unfair being done towards a particular person, then I'd do my best. But I was not an active feminist. I think women got on much better if they were involved in anything that men were also involved in. I think they were accepted then. With regard to the Commission on the Status of Women, she emphasized that my main aim was to get a united report. I'm not a great liberationist. I'm just one for equality, equality of opportunity. Perhaps not surprisingly, Beer was somewhat intolerant of the more radical wing of the women's movement. Referring to the representations made by various women's organizations during International Women's Year 1975, she stated that she admired those women's groups that had pinpointed specific problems and set about solving them. She added that she was somewhat impatient with some of the younger women who had not clearly defined what they wanted and said, I got a bit fed up at times with some of the young protesters just waving their arms saying we want our rights. This pragmatic approach to female equality was evident in her assessment of her own career. As noted, she frequently insisted that she hadn't experienced prejudice in the civil service because she was a woman. She said, I used to think that things could be weighted against me because I was a woman and a Protestant at that, but it just wasn't so. In fact, I got ahead a little bit faster than normal. Perhaps not surprisingly, the report in the Commission of the on the Status of Women invoked the more contemporary Lean In mantra, concluding that women must do more to help themselves. It urged women to seek out and accept positions of responsibility in trade unions, management, business, professional organisations and politics. Women's organisations were also advised to define their objectives clearly and to focus their objectives clearly on those activities. Beer was thus not openly associated with the cause of female emancipation, if you like. Like Jane Addams, hers was a feminism grounded in lived and practical experience. And yet, in her own quiet and determined way, she undoubtedly made a significant and lasting contribution to the advancement of Irish women. What then of the woman behind the public persona? The Irish Times obituary of Beer's former secretary at the 
at the Department of Industry and Commerce, John Layden suggested that he had no interests outside his work and family. The same could not be said of Thecla Beer. She was a founding member and later president of the Irish Youth Hustling Association and OIGA, a long-standing member of the Irish Film Society, and as its president in the 1970s, worked hard to have film recognised as an art with significant knock-on effects for funding. She developed an interest in art through her association with the acclaimed Irish artist Cecil King, was a keen theatre and opera goer, and commended the development of ballet in Cork as in the 1970s as thrilling and wonderful. Those who attended her lunch and cocktail parties included artists, colleagues from political and public life, such as Erskine Childers, Ken Whitaker, Patrick Lynch, Todd Andrews and Liam Devlin, literary figures such as Eileen O'Casey, Widow Sean and Hugh Leonard, and academics such as Roger McHugh, Professor of English at UCD, and her good friend AJ McConnell, former provost of this university. Although she resolutely separated public and private life, it was clear from talking to Thecla's family and friends that behind the successful public servant was an unfailingly kind and supportive daughter, sister, aunt and friend, a great lover of the arts and a sparkling hostess who loved to party and dance. While most of Beer's male contemporaries, or at least those that I interviewed, hadn't given much consideration to the fact that she didn't marry, or indeed to the fact that the marriage bar might have dissuaded her from doing so, many alluded to her feminine virtues. Major McDowell, former chief executive and chairman of the Irish Times said, she never married, but she was a very feminine woman. I don't mean that she used her feminine wiles and things like that, but she was always very carefully dressed and had her hair done. It wouldn't surprise me if I put it this way if Thecla had a boyfriend. Now, in the course of researching Thecla's biography and speaking to her surviving relatives, it became clear that Thecla did indeed have a significant other, namely leading Dublin businessman JJ O'Leary. O'Leary served on the board of Aer Lingus from its inception, owned Cahill Printing, and was at one point director of more than 50 companies. In many ways, it was an odd companionship. O'Leary was a gregarious character. He claimed, for example, to have smuggled Pat O'Donnell in and out of Spain during the Civil War, whereas beer was the essence of discretion. They had, however, many interests in common. Sharing a common passion for the theatre, they regularly frequented O'Leary's box at the Gaiety. He became infected by her interest in golf, while she in turn was introduced to the world of sailing. In later years, the duo travelled widely together. The relationship was, however, complicated by the fact that O'Leary, a Catholic, had in his early life been briefly married and then separated. And whilst this would scarcely raise an eyebrow today, it would undoubtedly have created something of a scandal at the time. And given Thecla's prominent public profile, she understandably didn't speak publicly about the relationship. A couple of romantic letters survived amongst the private papers I surveyed when researching her biography, but my inclination then as now to, is to avoid sensationalising the relationship and thus imposing on the past the prurient and present centred preoccupations of our times. Now, concluding reflections. For many of Beer's contemporaries, commitment to the public service was broadly inspired by the politics of post-independence Ireland. Liam Devlin suggested, however, that Beer was very different in that she hadn't any political alignments in any way. Todd Andrews similarly claimed that she had no interest whatsoever in politics. In an interview with Francis O'Rourke in 1975, he said, politics was too inexact a science, too intuitive maybe for her brand of rationality. Her very real concern for the public good had a different origin. He went on to refer to Beer's religious background and suggested that her sense of, public, uh, sense of duty had deeper roots in Irish history. He, she had, he said, the kind of public and private virtues, the community spirit, the cultural and intellectual values one associates with what Yeats spoke of as one of the great stocks of Europe. Now, viewed in a certain light, Thecla was indeed of the line of Burke, Grattan, Swift, Emmett and Parnell. But my sense of the woman is that she would have bristled at the inherent sectarianism of Yeats's boast. The simple fact is that Thecla was no maid to measure Irish Protestant. She was neither especially privileged nor victimised. She avoided politics, but pursued her own brand of pragmatic patriotism. A bit like my own mother, she was pathologically practical. She had a seemingly endless capacity for hard work, could digest and retain huge quantities of technical information, and could hold her own with ministers, semi-state directors, and international delegations. Deploying these skills and attributes, she broke plenty of glass ceilings and beckoned others to follow. Given her outstanding public service career and her role as the chair of the Commission on the Status of Woman, it's not surprising that Beer was the recipient of honours and accolades. In June 1960, an honorary doctorate in civil and canon law was conferred on her by this college. Later that year, she was invited to become an honorary life member of the RDS. 
1973, she became the first female president of the Social and Statistical Inquiry Society. And perhaps most interestingly, she was, as noted, mooted as a potential candidate during three, successful presidential, three successive presidential elections. Now, Beer herself was merely bemused by such suggestions and told the Irish press in November 1976 that it is a good idea to have a woman president, but maybe at another time. While such tributes indicate that Beer's achievements were recognised in her later years and at the time of her death, she has since gradually faded from public consciousness. There are no summer schools in her name, no lectures or buildings in her honour, and she merits but a passing mention, if any, in most surveys of 20th century Ireland. Now, at one level, this reflects broader trends. In 2016, the Cambridge historian Bethany Hughes estimated that women occupy 0.5% of recorded history. Now, Thecla, the statistician, may well wish to wrestle with the precision of the calculation, <laughs> but I think we can take the overall imbalance as read. Given the relative underrepresentation of women in Irish history, it is, of course, interesting to consider who makes the cut. And as I dipped my toes back into the history of women in Ireland, what struck me was the prominence of the overtly exceptional, Broderick's wild Irish woman, Lenehan's defiant Irish woman, and Matthew's renegades and female dissidents. Prostitutes, prisoners, those ensnared by poverty, and the occasional president get a look in, but the understated are well understated. This is all the more apparent in the era of social media, of viral heat and noise. But in the wise words of my County Derry compatriot Seamus Heaney, anyone with gumption and a sharp mind will take the measure of two things, what's said and what's done. Thecla channeled her energies into the latter and in her own quiet and determined way made a substantive contribution both to the public service and to Irish life. It's in keeping with her style that her tombstone in Stillorgan is simply inscribed, Thecla June Beer, 1901 to 1991, civil servant. But as I hope you'll agree, she was much, much more. Thank you. I'm sure you'll all agree with me that that was a brilliant lecture and thank you Anna for, for it for such a, an important lecture, such a, a learned lecture and such a truly interesting account of a life uh, very well lived. I think it gives us much to think about, um, perhaps not least that many of our graduates go into the civil service and we value that as highly as we do contributions in business or in academia or uh, in the arts and your lecture is a great testament to that. It's uh, important too to note that uh, many of, or some of Tecla Beer's family, uh, extended family are here, and also two of uh, JJ O'Leary's family. I'm not going to say much other than the obvious really that Tecla Beer's achievements are an inspiration to us all, to us all. It's right, uh, right that we remember our achievements and that we celebrate them as we have done here today in the Trinity Monday Memorial Discourse. And it serves only for me to ask for one final round of applause, ladies and gentlemen, for Anna Bryson. Thank you.